So we've been using Notepad++ as our code editor, and there's plenty of them out there. As I said earlier in the day, Sublime and uh, Brackets, etc. But we've got this one, and this is the one we'll be using. And I think we've got other ones installed on these computers. I see Aptana Studio and Android Studio. I think we've got Eclipse and other things here. But we're using Notepad++. You can use whatever you'd like. You can download it. The thing is, though, anything that you uh, download to our computers will erase after you turn off your computer. So you'll have to remember to install it again. And I'll remind us of that because um, this is a public lab. Many people use these computers. You don't want to accidentally leave your important stuff on the desktop and forget to take it with you. As soon as our computers restart, it loses what you did for your safety. Now, our editing environment here is the basic Notepad++. And honestly, this is not the best for long-term coding because this is this is a white light blasting you in the eyes for as long as you are looking at your code. It can fatigue you. So I'm going to show you here something that might be useful to you to change the color of your of your coding environment. Other ones have already sort of embraced these other colors, mm -hmm. other other coders like uh, brackets and such. But here's how you can do it in Notepad. I'm going to keep mine on the default because it's most readable on the projector. But if you'd like to change it, here's where you do it. Go up to your settings, your settings menu at the top, and go to Style Configurator. I don't think that's a real word, but click on Style Configurator. And then you can go right here. Select Theme, Default, Style, maybe look at Blackboard. Notice how the color changes. That's a little more pleasant, actually. When you're looking at code for a long time, you don't want all that white light blasting you for hours, especially those that just can't put the, can't put the, the software away because I've almost got it fixed. <laughs> Obviously, I can't show this one on the screen. I can't see my comments. But on your screen, they probably look just fine. Um, what else do we have? We've got khaki, just another design. I, I don't really like that one. I don't think it has enough contrast. Uh, just jumping around twilight. There's a lot of variations on this dark themes, which you'll probably find a good one that you like. And these dark ones are usually the better ones for you to code long term. I personally always switch mine at home to Bespin. I like that that has a mixture of dark and light and things pop out like this. It's not so good for my projector, so I won't use it. I'm using the default one. And you've got some other ones, like if you, if, you're, if you use Vim in the old days, you can have that kind of style of a uh, terminal. But we all know that if you're a real programmer, you've got to choose this, <coughs> this one. <laughs> so that's the Hello Kitty theme, and it uh, works really well. You'll be able to see all your comments nicely and your attributes. Whenever you like one, you can just click Save, and it'll save it. Again, you have to do that every time you come in. Deep freeze prevents you from keeping your dis your 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 style. I'll be, I'll keep mine on default, but I would recommend you check out the other ones. The darker ones are easier on the eyes. Okay, so we were starting to explore CSS. If you go over to W3Schools, you can look up the whole CSS reference, every single CSS value that we can use to further explore this. What I've done is I've added these colors, these background colors. Well, we can edit background colors and text color as well. Let's say I wanted to make my background color. Right now it's a, it's a shade of purple. But let's say I wanted to use the coolest color of all in my background, which would be black. That looks really nice, uh, but I can't see anything now. I can't see my text. Here, there's text. Black text on a black background. It's invisible. It's there. I just can't see it. So, in this case, I would need to change my text color. We've used the background color um, property, but we haven't altered the text color. The text color is still default, black. So let's look at changing text color property. The way we do this is we just add more properties to the style attribute. We've got the background color property, semicolon, space. Now we can add another property, text color, for example. So when they were inventing CSS in about 1996, I think, 
um, they said, okay, let's have background dash color to control the background color. And then you would think logically, okay, then we'll have text color, text dash color to control the text color. No one had that good idea in 1996, so it's actually simply color. Color means text color. And that one, let's say, put white. All my text becomes white. Background color is black, semicolon, color colon, white, semicolon. That means I can add multiple CSS properties in this style attribute. That semicolon is like a is like a comma in a list. I want bacon, comma, eggs, comma, milk, comma, hash browns in CSS. I want background color, semicolon, text color, semicolon, height, semicolon, width, semicolon. So semicolons are used to delineate each property of CSS, and it's got the the name of the property and the value of the property. Notice everything became white text except the link. That's special. We'll talk about that later. But if I can add a different color property to the whole thing, I can add a different text color property to individual elements. So if I go to summer 2016, the H2 tag is what is controlling or what is showing summer, and it's set to the default but the default has been overridden. Even though I wrote body style, it trickled down to H2. That's the cascade in CSS. Cascading style sheets. Cascading, a cascade like a waterfall. Water starts at the top, falls down, it hits everything below it. Cascade. CSS. Depending where and how we write our code, it trickles down to other elements. We have parent elements and child elements. Again, we'll talk about that complexity later. But in short, something inside of something is usually a child element. H2 is inside of body. So we wrote body, gave it style, and it cascaded, it trickled down to everything inside of it. Until on heading one, we broke that, and we gave it a different style, and that overrid the previous one. So it does have to do, to some degree, to the order of where you write the code and other factors that we'll get to. But that's cascading, cascading style sheets, and style is design. And sheet, we'll talk about that one later. Let's say I wanted to alter this, so style, uh, color this time, let's just say, and uh, yellow. So I've got yellow text on a black background. I didn't have to say black, uh, back, a background here. I didn't have to say a background here because I gave background up here, higher in the cascade. I'm more specific right over here. And you'll say, okay, well, if I'm learning that, then what I can do with H with the A tag is the same thing there. I can go to style, color, and I want to make that text color red. I want it to make it nice and red to stand out. It didn't, it didn't inherit it automatically. In that case, from the top white color, that one's a special case. A link is a special case because it's a link. It's not just regular text. It's a link. It has other meaning. The A tag was overriding the meaning of the default colors. In this case, I changed it. Uh, but um, sometimes it doesn't actually change. Oftentimes it doesn't change simply by adding style. Adding, link, adding, colors to, adding styles to links is a little more complex than this. And so I have to say that in the grand scheme of things, I would put, I would mark this as well, HTML, easy, CSS, harder, JavaScript, hardest. You can make a case that they're all easy and that they're all hard, and that they're all hardest, especially if you're a beginner. But when you learn a lot about all of these languages and what they do and how they interact and how they work and such, 
you're often going to see that HTML is the easiest one of the three. Learning HTML, much easier. CSS, even if you have years of experience with it, it it's often still hard because CSS is like a puzzle puzzle pieces. This piece fits with this piece, and if you're missing this piece, you can't complete the puzzle. Uh, and so we will see over and over that what would seem to be an easy fix, style background <coughs> color equals yellow, doesn't work because some other thing is conflicting. Something else in the cascade is conflicting, and we have to debug it and try to figure out what conflicts. And we can figure it out but oftentimes CSS is going to be harder to deal with than CS than HTML. And then when we get to JavaScript, that'll be the hardest, because we have so many things that could go wrong there with incorrectly named variables and the scope of our variables and misspelled function calls and all of this complexity, and everything's working, syntax, no syntax errors, but then you have a logic error. We'll talk about this later, but types of errors, <coughs> syntax errors, logic errors. Did you write your code right? Logic errors. Does it do what you want it to do? You can write your code perfectly fine. You spelled it all properly and you put it in the right place and everything. That's not a syntax error, that's a logic error, and those are even harder to figure out. This was supposed to save the name to the database and randomize it and then display it on screen. I wrote all my code properly, but something in the middle is wrong and it's not randomizing it for real, it's putting it in the same order. Alphabetical order, I wanted it in random order. So that could have been a logic error, not a syntax error. That's why I believe JavaScript is the hardest one. So I've got some design here. It's looking really weird, but if you were, if you had any artistic ability, you could probably choose good colors. And later on, we'll have a, a talk about um, picking good colors and good design and all of that. Just whatever you have is is fine, it doesn't have to be a masterpiece yet, we'll, we'll fine-tune this later. So I've got some, some project, um, and what we've been writing here is some CSS. And not only what can we do is uh, we can um, play with colors and such, but we can also play with alignment and um, placement and such. Let's try this. I want to um, I want to center my text. I want that Android Apps Part 1 to be centered on screen. We have a CSS property that will let us do that. So specifically, I want to edit my Android Apps Part 1 text. In my example, on what line should I go to to edit that? Line 8. Line 8 is where I've got it saying Android apps. So background color pink, color white, we'll add a new CSS property. So after the semicolon of color white, we will say text dash align colon <coughs> center semicolon. So we're giving it a property and a value and then the end semicolon. So that will, that should center <coughs> only this text. Like that. So no, no matter the size or the width of your web browser, it should keep the text centered automatically. Actually, I want to center everything. So it would be inefficient for me to then go to H2 and add text to line center, and then go to this paragraph, text to line center. It would be inefficient to add it to every single one of those elements. This again comes back to the cascade. 
what if I add it to a higher level so it trickles down? Body is one of the highest levels because everything is in the body. There are higher levels, of course, HTML. Uh, but for body, we'll, we've got background color, text color. We'll add text dash align center to that. Text align center. We've added it to body. Everything gets aligned to center, even the graphic. This is again sometimes the confusion, the annoyance of CSS. Text align center makes me think it's only going to align text, but it aligned a graphic as well. Well, I got what I wanted. I got everything aligned to the center text align center. And I've written it again in the h1 tag here, so center it and center it, no, no harm, no foul, really. I could take away text align center to h1 because I've already got it up higher in the cascade, so that's a little bit of vestigial code. That one's not necessary, it's already aligning it for me on the previous line. <clears throat> Let's say uh, I, I like what I have here so far. Notice as I stretch my web browser, it automatically keeps it centered. At a certain point, it might kind of get too scrunched up, but it keeps it centered. What I would actually like is that, let's say, um, that background color that I've got inside of H1, I like it, but I would rather that it doesn't go all the way to the edge. I would like it for for it to kind of uh, be have a little empty space along the edges, like my syllabus, or when you write a paper and it and, it, and the instructor asks you to have one inch margins all the way around it so that your text doesn't go all the way to the edge. I want to do that. I want to add a little bit of space around the edges of my document, like this. We'll go back to uh, the code, and we will add another property. I want it, again, to be added to the body. I want to affect the whole visible document. So text align center, space. Um, let's add padding, colon. I want to add a little bit of padding, some space in, inside here so that it's not bumped up to the edge. Let's start um, just to see what it looks like. Let's try... Uh, 25 px, semicolon, 25 pixels, padding, colon, <coughs> space, 25 pixels. Here's before, here's after. I have a little bit more space on the edge compared to previously, but now I've also got extra space on the top. This is before. This is after. I really only wanted extra space on the sides, left and right. I didn't really want it at the top. So what I've done here is I've added a CSS property, a value to that property, that has been applied to all four sides of the screen. Every element that we deal with actually is inside of an, indiv uh, inside of an invisible box. Everything that we add, every tag and such, is part of an invisible box. Right here, when we had just very, very plain, it wasn't obvious. But when we started to add colors, it became obvious. There was a box behind heading one. And when I added background color, I could see the box. There's a box behind summer 2016. There's a box behind the picture. There's a box behind everything. It's the box model. And the whole visible screen itself is also a box with four sides. A top side, right side, bottom side, left side. Four sides. So what I've done in the CSS right now is to say, give me 25 pixels of padding of empty space to all four sides of the body box, the, the body's <coughs> box. Instead, I could define each individual side like this. 25 
Well, let's do it like this. 5px, 25px, 5px, 25px. 5 pixels, space. 25 pixels, space. 5 pixels, space. 25 pixels, space. These are... This is the top padding, then the right padding, then the bottom padding, then the left padding. It's clockwise, starting from the top. Top padding, <coughs> right padding, bottom padding, left padding, in that order. Here's the difference. That's 25, 25, 25, and here's 5. 25 on the right, 5 on the bottom. It's obviously a lot more because it doesn't reach the bottom. 25 on the left. So 5 at the top, 25 at right, 5 at bottom, 25 at the left. Just to make it obvious. 55 at the right. 75 at the, at the left. So 55 at the right, uh, 75 at the left, maybe 1 at the top. At the bottom doesn't quite matter, we don't have anything there yet. But that's top, right, bottom, left, in that order. It might be a good idea to make a note here. Using padding, you have top, right, left, bottom. Top, right, left, bottom. Clockwise. Always. What's that? Oh, sorry, yes. Top right, bottom left. Yes. Top right, bottom left. Clockwise. Top right, bottom left. You can remember it by terrible. T R B L. Terrible. Top right, bottom left. So what I've done here then is added 1 pixel top, 55 pixels right, 5 pixels bottom, 75 pixels left. So see, it looks a little off-center now. I've got 75 pixels here, I've got 50, 55 pixels there, so it looks like it's leaning off a little odd if I don't keep the same units. <coughs> so we're going to have some CSS properties that have multiple values like this. We've seen one value each so far. Brown on that, pink on that, um, this one's got four values that we could edit individually, or as we saw, if we put one value, it automatically puts that one value to all four sides. You could also do this trick. Instead of listing all four values, we could list two values. We could do 5px, 25px. What that does is it will take five pixels and put it at the top and bottom, equally. And then it'll take 25 and it'll put it on the right and left equally. So instead of listing all four, I can list two. And in that case, it's always top bottom and then right left. So that value adds both to the top and bottom, and the second value both to the right and left. So you see here where we can deal with CSS, we can deal with colors, we can deal with alignment, we can deal with paddings and margins and all of that kind of stuff. We can also deal with sizes of things. As I said a moment ago, we created a width for this graphic. 
And this works, but this is an older way to do it. Instead of having our graphic have a width like that, let's control it via CSS, just so we can do some other tricks with it. So jump down to whatever line number your is, minus 21, where your koala is at, or your picture, and instead of it having a width, let's remove that. Actually, just one quick thing. Let me remind myself. Will the style attribute override the plane attribute? Yes. So actually, if we leave with and further add style, style seems to take over what the, what the width is. That's kind of redundant. Which one is it? Well, style is taking over. Therefore, width 200 is, is, is vestigial. So I, I'm going to remove it. But anyway, the code for that is very simply like this. Style equals width. And you say, well, that's exactly the same as simply width equals 600. This is with CSS. Therefore, we can do more things with it. Um, we can do... Um, we can do uh, drop shadows, and we can do um, rounded corners, and that sort of thing. Let's, uh, let's do this. Uh, I'm going to change this size, just maybe 300 pixels. That's, that's no big deal. It's just changing the size. But instead, what I want to do is I want to use a, a little bit of modern CSS3. CSS also evolves, like HTML. HTML1, HTML2, etc. We've got HTML5, the newest one, which was footer and other things that we will do. CSS has been evolving, and the common one at the moment is CSS2, 2.1, I think. But we can do very cool things with the most modern version, CSS3. For example, I want to make this square graphic rounded. I want to add rounded corners. In the old days, what I would do is I would take this graphic and I would open it in Photoshop or some other graphic software, use my skills there, and round it, then put it on the screen here. But then the boss said, it's too round. Make it 20 pixels round instead of 25 pixels round. So I have to go back to Photoshop, redo the graphic, save it again, export it, and put it in here again. And then I say, well, actually, that's not so good. Put it back to 25. So I have to go back to Photoshop, reround it again, export it, put it in here. A lot of effort. So then web designers thought, well, can we make some code to let us do that easily? Yes. CSS3 property to, to round this. Let's add the semicolon there. We've got a width of this element. But now let's round the corners. And this is border dash radius, colon, and then we put, pick a value. Let's just start with maybe a 5px, 5 pixels of roundness on the four corners. We've set one value, so it applies to the four sides. We could apply a separate value to each corner. But let's try 5 pixels all around. There's before, sharp edge, there's after. Five pixels around this. Not so impressive. So 25 pixels, maybe. Okay, that's more obvious. And the boss says, actually, I want that to be 12 pixels round. No problem. Go back to the code, 12 pixels, done. This is the modern CSS 3. When I keep saying about modern this, modern that, on older browsers this doesn't work. Um, I'm currently using uh, Firefox. On our, what am I using? Yeah, Firefox. And uh, it's version like 40 something. 46. If this were like Firefox version 7, it might not work. But version 7 came out 10 years ago, so I don't have such an old browser. If I load this up in, in Chrome, if you're using Chrome, it should also work, because we've got a, a, a modern version of Chrome. Uh, about 
we've got in my case 51. So if I had version Chrome version 6, this might not work. Let's say I run this over on Internet Explorer. Works just fine. I've got the version Internet Explorer 11, the newest one. If I had Internet Explorer 6 or 7 or 9 or something, it might not work. But this is not so mission critical. This is icing on the cake. This looks nice. But if I still had pointed edges, it wouldn't break my sight. It wouldn't take away from people that can't see rounded edges. It's just icing on the cake. It's something nice, something extra. Um, so oftentimes when you learn about these modern things, it often also tells you about don't forget to add fallbacks and don't forget to add vendor prefixes and all of this stuff that says, okay, let's cover all the bases. Let's put in four versions of our code just to make sure it works everywhere. I'm of the mind of never mind about that. All the browsers eventually evolve. All the browsers catch up. Yes, there's lots of people out there that can't or won't upgrade their browsers. I read this great article a few years ago called To Hell With Old Browsers. It's very harsh, of course. But things evolve. And eventually, we are going toward mobile devices. These things, there's no such thing as Firefox 3 on this. There's no such thing as Internet Explorer 7 on this. There's no such thing as Google Chrome 2 on this. These devices have the newest um, features. They can handle CSS3. They can handle HTML5. Therefore, I'm not really going to touch on vendor prefixes and fallbacks and all of that. I'm going to use the most modern stuff. And yes, there's going to be older devices that can't handle rounded corners. Doesn't matter. They're going to still see the picture. It's still going to be clickable. It's still going to work. But it just doesn't have a rounded corner. And that's okay that they don't see every single thing. This is icing on the cake. One last thing, and then as we wrap up, one more thing to impress. That was a little bit of CSS3 right there, a little roundness. Another thing that we can do with CSS is drop shadows. Again, in the old days, I'd pull that up in Photoshop, add a drop shadow. The boss tells me it's wrong. I have to do it again. Well, here, to the graphic, we'll add one more property, one more CSS property. This one is um, box dash shadow. Sometimes, unfortunately, these things are not named exactly as what you would want them to be named. I would like to be called the property to be called roundness. Roundness colon 25. But it's called border <coughs> radius. I would like it to be called drop shadow. But it's called box dash shadow. In this case, this one's more complex because we have to add, uh, we have to add four values here. Let's just follow me along for a moment and I'll explain. Let's write 25 pixels, space, 25 pixels, space, 5 pixels, space, black. Semicolon. Save and run that. See the result and then I'll explain what this means. 25 pixels, 25 pixels, 5 pixels, black. What box shadow is doing is it's making a drop shadow behind your graphic. And what the parameters I gave it were, or the values that I gave it, 25 pixels. How far to the right do you want to move the shadow? 25 pixels. How far down do you want to move the shadow? 25 pixels down. How blurry do you want to make the shadow? 5 pixels. And what color do you want to make the shadow? Black. So if I want only a little bit of a shadow, I can put 5 pixels, 5 pixels. So now this is moved over just a little bit. 25 pixels, 5 pixels. 5 pixels of blurriness, well, what about less blurry? 1 pixel harder edge? Good question. What if I want to move it to the left? Well, we use negative values. Negative 5 pixels will move it to the left. If I want to move it up, 
negative value for the second one. Top left, drop shadow. So positive values, this is your x offset, this is your y offset, this is your blur, and then this is your color of your shadow. So what if I put in here a yellow drop shadow? Since it's digital, I can do that. Yellow. I'll make a note. Again, I'm going to put my code in the network folder a little bit later if you want a copy of it. Uh, but box shadow is made up of x offset, y offset, blur, and color. x and y, uh, which is actually a little bit backwards here. Um, X and Y on our web browser starts from the top left corner. So the top left corner of the uh, of the picture. See where my mouse is at. That's the that's the origin of this picture. So positive values of X will move the shadow to the right. Negative values then go to the left and move the shadow to the left. Positive val values move it down, which is often counterintuitive. I would think positive values go up. But because we're starting here, positive values go down, negative values go up, y offset, and then blurs, blur, and then color. So what's between positive and negative? Zero. What if you put here, zero, zero, no units, just zero, zero. You got a little blur, a little glow all around the picture without any Photoshop, without any graphics software. 0, 0, 0025 pixels with a red color. Look at that glowing red picture. I'm using the name of the color here, but yes, I can use here RGB and mix my purple color, which was 255, 0, 200, 100. And that gives me purple. So the fourth value in the drop shadow property of CSS3 is color, which I can use a color name or a color formula. And if you know about this, I haven't mentioned it yet, but we'll use it later. If you know hexadecimal numbers, you can put those in here too. So we'll have red, zero, and um, I don't know, 99, uh, purple. So hex colors. So this is um, this is what we're ending up with for the day. This is obviously a uh, a far cry from what we're going to get to here eventually. Remember our our example project. We're going to end up with that eventually. But you have to learn how to crawl before you can walk, before you can run. We will run eventually, but we're still crawling. If you had no experience in HTML. Look at what you created. Text, pictures, colors, special effects and such. If you have had experience with HTML, hopefully you learned one or two new things. As we go on, we will get much more complex. We will be able to get to this point relatively quickly. We're going to learn some more basic things here and there next time, and then we'll get a little faster <laughs> to that point. Talk about JavaScript still, of course. More things. We're not going to learn every single tag. We don't need to. We're not going to learn every HTML command, every JavaScript command, every HTML command. No one needs all <coughs> commands at all times. People need a couple dozen per project. So that's how we're going to be able to make a fully functional app without having to know everything about HTML. Check out those books, check out those websites, and if you want to know everything about web design, take this class over here. <laughs> take our huge Intro to Feud, F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-E-F-W-
not for that one. <coughs> What's that? There's no certificate for that one. That's just for parts of the program. Oh, okay, not for that one. For the whole <coughs> sequence. Yeah, okay, eventually you'll get a certificate. But uh, if anyone's taken that class, has anyone taken the feud classes? A couple people. Can you say anything about those classes? Maybe just I think they're very helpful. Very useful. So um, website planning was on design holiday. We won't be able to cover all of those things, but we will, as I've shown you, be able to make this web app and a mobile app eventually. And um, and give us some great results. So any any questions on things we've talked about so far today? I'm going to put my notes and my code into the network folder. Let me remind you where the network folder is at. So if you'd like a copy of my code and my notes, I'm going to put those in th I'm going to put those in there right now. my network folder is from the desktop you want to open the computer window at the top left open the classroom data drive Z Z as in zebra scroll down alphabetically to find campus Android 1 And what you'll find in there is my code as I, as I finished with it and my text file. If you want to go home and work with my code, if you simply double click it, it'll show it to you as a website. To go back to edit it in Notepad, you either have to go to Notepad and go to File Open, or if you install Notepad++ at home, you can <coughs> right click it, edit with Notepad++. So I recommend try this stuff at home, see what we did and try to do it yourself again, maybe watch the videos, we'll go on, on on Thursday. If you've got a Mac at home, download the alternatives to Notepad like Brackets or Sublime, etc. And uh, practice a little bit because all of this stuff, you use it or you lose it. You don't write this code on a regular basis, you're gonna forget. And that's okay, you can look it up again. But the more you do it and the more it's on your mind, the faster you can do it. So we'll be back in two days, and uh, we'll learn some more.